Hi, I'm Steve Hawks, uh, physician assistant. I um, practice in here in Las Vegas and uh, I'm a member of the advisory board for the uh, Durham 23 meeting and have been so for uh, the last few years. And I'm very grateful for the opportunity to work with such great um, providers. And uh, there's a lot of work that goes in, into this meeting that uh, I hope everyone will be able to attend. We've got great faculty and all those uh, uh, people behind the scenes make this a great meeting. So hope you enjoy this case. Um, it's uh, be careful where you squeeze the lemons. So the learning objectives for this case study will be able to um, importance of a thorough history when evaluating any rash or condition, recognize and have a differential diagnosis for skin rashes, be able to outline treatment plans for acute and long-term dermatitis treatment. I'm really going to be focusing on uh, the history and evaluating uh, these rashes and important of the history. So before we uh, get into the this patient history, I just want to talk about our uh, our staff that we work with, our MAs, and and when they go in a room and get information and then present it to us, it's important to uh, to listen to them and make sure that we understand what we're getting into when we go into that room. And so sometimes a patient uh, or a MA will come out of the patient room and tell us, oh, this patient's got some white spots and vitiligo, for example. And I go in their room and obviously they've got, you know, pityriasis rosea or they maybe have tinea versa color. So try to uh, take that with a grain of salt and don't make, uh, you know, a decision just from what the MA is telling you when you go in the room. Go in there with an open mind and make sure you get your differentials there. Also. Uh, you know, have the, the MAs um, get a small history of the patient and their family history. Uh, I've had an example where I walked into a patient's room and asked how John was doing and um, the patient said, well, he just passed six months ago. Kind of an embarrassing situation. So kind of know before when you're going into the room. And um, one other thing is just, you know, know something about the, the patient, get a uh, idea of would they go on vacation, since the last time you've seen them, we have a little sticky note that we put on the patient's chart and we try to put those important factors into the chart so we can have some conversation. And it goes a long way with a patient when you say, hey, how was your uh, your Jamaica vacation You know, two months ago? And that's just one of those things, or you know, how was your birthday? Any of those, or how was your anniversary? There's a lot of those things that are, are very good in um, talking with your patients. So. Let's move on and get to the history of this 22 year old female. She presented with a rash to her trunk and lower legs for four days after swimming in the uh, cenotes in Cancun, Mexico. Um, if you haven't done that, that's quite a, uh, a pretty cool thing. Those cenotes are very, some of them are deep enough that people don't even know how deep they are. Uh, pretty amazing if you ever have a chance to go. Uh, but she stated she brushed up against rocks while swimming and noticed the rash on her trunk, legs, and buttocks. Later that evening, she mentioned that she had been hiking that same day in the jungle as well. And then the next morning, she said the rash, rash was worse. And later in that day, there was blisters that formed. All right, so here's let's start off with uh, some of these questions for rash. So when did the rash start and has it spread? Those are important questions to, to find out if this is something that's just localized or did it spread and then this went away and now it's over here. So that's a great question I start off with. And then I go to, is it itchy or painful? Sometimes it can be both. Uh, so that's one thing that's, that's important as well to help a differential. Also, has there been any blisters associated with the rash? And has the rash, uh, have you had a rash like this before? Uh, and you know, how long has it stayed? Has it gone away in a day? Has it been two or three weeks that it stayed there? And then have you taken or applied anything for the rash? For example, Patient comes in and says, oh, I've had this rash, but I've put, you know, I went to my primary care and they gave me this uh, triamcinolone and I put this on there and it's made this rash a lot worse. And we kind of all know what, what they're, where that's going. And so that's, those are good questions to ask to help us make a good uh, differential and, and diagnosis. And there, is there anything that improves it or make it, makes it worse? And also, do you have any other symptoms? Uh, and that's important, you know, if, uh, if you feel ill or you have any fever or any other kind of symptoms, that's important. So just going back to these questions again, we want 
onset, location, duration, character, aggravating and relieving factors, timing, and severity. All right, and moving on again. Have you been on any new medications, oral or topical? Any changes in your diet or new foods introduced? And have you been on vacation? That was a big one with this patient. Have you been hiking? Another big one with this patient. Uh, history of hobbies and occupation. Uh, those are also very good questions uh, with this diagnosis you'll see and uh, many other kind of rashes that also can be um, an occupation that leads us to the diagnosis. So in her history, uh, she mentioned she was in Cancun, Mexico. And that is where this kind of pays off is I asked her, were you using any limes or did you have any limes or lemons? And she looked at me and says, well, yeah, of course I did. I was drinking. That's what you do in Cancun. And she, she tends to uh, like her alcohol. So she was using lots of limes and lemons, she said. And then she also stated that she was, had been hiking in the jungle. So, you know, some of these things started popping into my head, like, okay, I think pretty much kind of have a good idea what's going on here. So let's go to her past medical history. I treated her for acne. Um, she'd been on topical retinoids, oral doxycycline, and um, she wasn't taking any of those medicines at this time, and she was uh, not taking any, um, over-the-counter medications. She has asthma, a uh, plantar wart that I've treated before, and she drinks uh, one to two times per week. Allergies were just penicillin. So as I mentioned, the medication she's on, the triferritine cream, which she's discontinued, the clindamycin, um, which is the, um, a generic clindamycin and the BPO wash 10%. And then the inhaler for her asthma, just as needed. So she wasn't using any medications at this time. So that kind of helps me try to figure out, is this a medication? Um, uh, Next slide, the physical exam. So on her exam, she had linear, linear streaking, irregular shaped macular patches with erythema and hyperpigmentation to her anterior thighs, buttocks. Abdomen, uh, she also had some healing blisters also noted on the thighs and buttocks. So I'm gonna play this slide. This is a picture of her. She was so kind to show us or a video of her swimming in the cenotes. So this is where she said she got her rash from. So here she is swimming, she's in there with some of the limestone swimming around. All right, so here is some of the pictures that we're gonna look at here of her. Uh, this is again, four days later from being in Cancun and you can see there's pretty thickened and slightly uh, viol violaceous plaques with some erythema there. And here's uh, kind of missing some of this picture up here. Hopefully you can see that, but she's had some blisters that uh, have popped and started to peel up here in this area. And this is not a great picture, but we'll get to a better picture here. But you can see these are pretty, they look pretty, they look painful for sure. When she had this, she said it was a bit painful for those first two or three days, but it started to feel better. Now, here's some just hyperpigmentation. And you can see these are kind of like almost drip spots here. That'll give you a clue to this diagnosis as well. And here's a, the best picture that shows all of these different areas of really a lot of erythema and uh, areas there. And we'll show a picture later of uh, kind of a four, four days after the, you know, the rash started and then three months later. But here's some more just streaking. This is a pretty common clinical picture of this diagnosis. And I'm sure a lot of you already know what we're gonna be talking about here. here's another good example. All right, so we have to throw some differential diagnoses in here. Um, and so I think that, you know, you think of contact dermatitis, thermal electrical burn, erythema multiforme is kind of a stretch for this one, but we have to remember this diagnosis 
is not going to always present itself in the way it did with this patient. It presents in so many different ways. It can just be on the hands or just maybe on the legs or even just the abdomen area. Uh, fixed drug eruption, late stage, bolus and pentigo. Um, again, you know, it can be a bolus just from the blisters that we're seeing. Medication-induced phototoxic reaction, sunburn, and PCT also. If we see this a lot on the hands, and so PCT should pop up to your, you know, differential if you see this just only on the hands and nowhere else. And also physical abuse. Uh, sometimes this gets uh, misdiagnosed for uh, physical abuse, and it can go either way. So it's good to make sure you always have that in the back of your mind. Also, uh, I didn't have on the slide here, but uh, herpatic, also any kind of a HSV possible or even um, a zoster sometimes, uh, and also cupping. Sometimes if the cupping is not perfectly round, you can use that also as a differential. All right, so we know that it's phytophotodermatitis. I'm sure everybody figured that out. And uh, she had been using a lot of limes and a lot of lemons. She told me that that's, she'd been using them almost every day. And so that's kind of, uh, it was pretty much a giveaway when we got talking about her, her vacation and what she'd been doing. So let's uh, go with the discussion. And we're going to, uh, photophytodermatitis represents non-immune mediated responses induced by Furacumarins that sensitize epithelial DNA to ultraviolet radiation, causing burns induced by the plants. The furacumarins, which protect plants from fungal pathogens and sorlins, contact the skin, followed by exposure to UV light, more specifically the UVA light. And it's kind of interesting that the furacumarins uh, actually protect plants from uh, fungus. Uh, kind of an interesting fact there. And as we know, we do PUVA for vitiligo and um, psoriasis, obviously in a controlled environment, but it's interesting that these sorlins, uh, you know, people in, in kind of older days had really used a lot of that to treat some of the uh, different kind of skin conditions. All right, so signs of inflammation such as erythema, edema, and bullae typically form in eight to 24 hours. Lesions only appear on sun exposed areas. So you can have um, even just some of the like uh, fig leaf or, um, you know, having the lime juice or lemon juice or any citrus juice, you can have that on, uh, on your fingers and your hands. And then you happen to just wipe it maybe on your abdomen, but you wear a shirt and you go out in the sun. It's only your hands that are going to be exposed and you're going to have the rash, the burn, and you know, and the area on the abdomen is not going to be affected. So it has to be sunlight exposure. So that's another thing. Was this a sunlight? And that's it. And the history, ask the patient, was this ever sun exposed? What areas were sun exposed? Sometimes if they've been drinking too much, they don't know what was exposed. So keep that in mind as well. Lesions typically heal in one to two weeks with hyperpigmentation, which may take several weeks or months to resolve. And we'll show you a slide on that as well. If sunlight exposure is limited, then the erythema can go unnoticed until the hyperpigmentation appears. And that's on that one physical or the picture on the patient's abdomen. It was just a little hyperpigmentation. So she uh, said she mostly wore a, or a bikini um, and a couple of days had a, uh, a shirt on. So she didn't really get too much on the abdomen because she had it covered with the shirt. And this, uh, this phytophotodermatitis titus is also known as uh, the margarita rash, if you've heard that before. All right, so here are the two pictures from March 2023 and June 2023, three months later from uh, Cancun. She still has a good amount of post-inflammatory hyperpigmentation that uh, she's not real happy about. She has used some hydroquinone but it's not very consistent with it. So it's not doing a great job. And again, this is just kind of a tincture of time with uh, a lot of these uh, kind of conditions with burns. And I'm not 100% convinced that this is rash or the phytophotodermatitis was from 
the limes or the lemons that uh, she was, was using and had that obviously we see some on her abdomen in those previous pictures and on her thighs uh, just that pretty consistent with um, the diagnosis and the clinical picture of that streaking but these pictures here on the buttocks have a little different look and so she said she was in the jungle hiking that same day it's possible that she also had uh, had sap from a plant some in the jungle and uh, not sure what that plant would be but uh, that's a possibility. So phytophotodermatitis is also more prevalent in the spring and summer. This is when the plants are generally most active as you know we, the substance might be toxic to human is because it's more in the summertime but we have to think about this um, especially in the northwest, northeast and the midwest a lot of people like to go to the tropical islands and so in the winter time you're going to see this in Las Vegas I see this all year round but you know if you live in those other areas you're still going to see it in the uh, um, the winter time occasionally for patients and that's why that uh, history is so important you know find out when they go on vacation to a tropical area or if they were out in the sun for a very you know long period of time it doesn't take much on a hot day with a lot of sun with with some of these uh, substances that we'll go over these plants and citruses. And it is possible to spread or sap before the furacumarins are exposed to UVA rays. Like I mentioned, you can get it on your hands and wipe it somewhere else. And, and then once that gets exposed, it's you're gonna get the rash. If not, you'll never see the rash. And this is especially important uh, parent-child. The parent can actually um, transpose that onto uh, that sap or the juices onto their child. And again, some of these case, uh, cases of the condition in children are incorrectly mistaken for child abuse. So here's those common guilty plants. We got limes. I think most of the time, I always, it seems to be lime is the, the biggest culprit. Uh, some of these others, it's, it's not as, and I think maybe sometimes they go undiagnosed just because of the history, you just don't get a good history, but lemons, bergamot, burning bush, bitter orange, gas plant, common rue, now that's a one that you can see from just the, the sap from that, carrots, cow parsley, wild chervil, fennel, dill, parsnip is another one that can be really, um, uh, that can cause a pretty, pretty good burn. Celery, um, figs, mustard greens, buttercup, and St. John's wort. All right, so here we see a picture of the mustard plant. This is um, native to temperate regions in Europe, Asia, and North Africa, but it's also been introduced to North and South Americas, uh, especially in the agriculture regions of North America. So that's a easy plant to pick out there. And this is the common rue. Uh, this is more in the Western United States. Um, this is one that'll have sap that you can definitely get uh, the phytophotodermatitis from this one. Also, great rue is common in the eastern United States. So two different, uh, same plant, but just kind of a different variation. So who's at risk here? Uh, bartenders, agriculture workers, and grocers are particularly prone to the lesions, especially on the hands. Um, the vacationers are the, usually around the mouth. We see that where they've take, actually taken a lime or a lemon and put it you know, they like to suck that after the, um, the drink or before, and then that gets all around their lips. So they can get a pretty bad, bad burn around their lips. And also, uh, yeah, the limes and celery also around the hand area. So gardening and just walking through any wooded area where these uh, plants may be contact, you know, plants during midday, and then, you know, UVA is high if you're hiking and higher elevation, that kind of thing too. Uh, that sounds a little bit stronger at that elevation. And if you're outside and run into these plants, you're going to have, uh, that's where you see it usually on the legs and then on sometimes the hands and the, uh, the arms, the lower forearms and wrists. And so touching these plants that have a lot of sap. Hey guys, random question. Is it bad to swallow the lime in your Corona? Andy, did you swallow your lime? No, he definitely did. Yes, I. Limes are a superfood. All right. So did Andy swallow the lime? Right. We should do a poll on that. I think he swallowed the lime as well. 
according to Snoop Dogg, it's a super fruit. Just be careful when you're out in the sun. So let's uh, talk about some of these treatment options. So the blisters, and typically we're not gonna see this acutely. We always see this, like I did about four days later, you come off vacation, or sometimes we'll see it here when it's, you know, uh, in Vegas where people are just having, you know, after the weekend and they wanna come in because they've got this blistering rash or whatever, but it's usually, so we don't really treat this. Usually the patient's gonna have to kind of figure this out on their own, but. Uh, we like to keep those blisters intact uh, to prevent infection unless they're too painful. And then that's obviously something we can do in open sterile. So cool soaks and compresses is acetaminophen. Uh, I like the NSAIDs better. I think they do a better job with the anti-inflammatory effect and with pain. Uh, photo protection routinely with the clothing and mineral sunscreen. I think that's an important. I like the mineral sunscreen. And then... Uh, just to decrease some of that inflammation, the low to mid point potency topical corticosteroids twice a day is needed. So any of those, the hydrocortisones, the triamcinolone uh, can be used as well. Typically, um, it's a self-limiting um, condition. And so we don't really need to do a lot, especially if there's not a lot of blistering. So here's some, uh, just some learning points. Phytophotodermatitis must be a suspect when a patient appears with a, you know, erythematous rash in the sun-exposed areas after exposure to plants containing a photoactive furocumarin. Um, and that doesn't have to be a plant. We use that a lot. I'm saying plants, but I think the biggest culprits are still like the limes and the lemons and, and some of the sap and that kind of things from these plants. The diagnosis is made typically clinical history and uh, but there's some confusion that can go on with other skin conditions requiring a high index of suspicion. So photodermatitis should be considered in any child who presents with pigmented brownish macules in skin exposed areas. So that's where it kind of can be tough, but you can see a lot of times with bruising, you know, you get see that change that happens to a bruise, the yellow discoloration and that as it, as it changes. This, you're just gonna see that post-inflammatory hyperpigmentation and it's gonna just kind of have a different look. So just one thing, here's an unusual clinical scenario to consider with this patient management. I've never seen this, but you can get absorption. There's uh, patients who have eating, eaten celery root and you know substantial amount of sorrel and, and it can uh, also uh, rash wherever it would just over again be only where sun exposed areas are here's some references uh, that i've done or looked at that's helped with this uh, case study and uh, i'm going to leave you with uh, steve carell and uh, a movie called get smart to squeeze the lemon so thank you. Uh, it's uh, been my pleasure to be able to present this case study, and hopefully you've um, had some things come to your mind, especially with just taking a history to be very thorough and, and realize that's a very uh, important part of what we do is taking a history. And, and I just hope that you've had some reconfirmation of um, this diagnosis and, and hope to have helped in any way. Thank you again.